Hey everybody, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Monday. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers play their first preseason game on Sunday. They drop it to the Brooklyn Nets, but Malik Monk looked <laughs> really good. Well, they, most of the Brooklyn. Some I was going to say they're more like the Brooklyn Net. Because <laughs> it were, really wasn't. <laughs> it was really not the Nets. <laughs> people wearing Brooklyn Nets uniforms. Yeah, it was the beat Brooklyn the Lakers. Nets. On, like, on, we're, we got to get through the open here. Malik <laughs> Monk looked really good. Uh, we'll talk about what his impact could be uh, going forward if he keeps this up. That's coming up on Locked on Lakers next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Look, Andy, if you're going to sit here and tell me that Javon Carter and DeAndre Bembry aren't iconic Brooklyn Nets, I will fight you uh, over Actually, that. given the real history of the Brooklyn Nets, they're probably top 10. <laughs> there's, there's, there ain't a lot there of there that there. many iconic. Now. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to mention, we'll say, try to save a little time talking about Cam Thomas because uh, he, of, among all the Brooklyn Nets, was the most interesting one to me, obviously, too, with the potential sliding doors universe where he might be a Laker. Um, but anyway, so the Lakers lose 123 97 on Sunday afternoon in a very oddly timed uh, preseason game. And it seemed like didn't suit the Lakers very well to be starting well, that early. I, I could be totally, totally just reading into things and projecting uh, my own interpretation. But I thought it was really interesting that Mello, uh, during Friday's availability after practice, was he, was so asked, he was asked about, you know, whether even keep in mind, it's a preseason game. You're a 19 year veteran. You've been through just about everything, blah, blah, blah. Like, does it jump out at you at all, the idea that your first preseason game is against this star-studded team? You are the most star-studded team in the West. He's like, no, what jumped out at me was that it was a 12-30 <laughs> Sunday game. <laughs> and then Mello, like, like literally within like 30 minutes, we hear from the Lakers that Mello is not going to be playing in this nope. game. I nope. desperately wanted the Lakers to list Mello, DNP, 2 and early. <laughs> <laughs> he shows up in one of those old fashioned, like 1860s style nightcaps. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I'm not getting like, I'm not getting up that early for a game that doesn't count. F this man. Like this is literally I'm too old for this yeah, shit. I'm not I'm not doing that. <laughs> um all right, so but I mean Mello didn't play, Trevor Ariza didn't play, uh LeBron and Russell Westbrook didn't play. Anthony Davis played a quarter. Um before we get to Malik Monk and THT and Dwight Howard, who are really the I think the three most notable Lakers uh, Dwight in this had like game. a Dave Lynchian game. <laughs> <laughs> Dwight had a Dwight had a vibe. <laughs> Dwight had a, yes, a very did. Dwight vibe that I, I really want to make sure we talk about before the end of the show. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Anthony Davis. Uh, Frank Vogel said he Davis wanted to play in this game. He certainly had the option of skipping it like the rest of these guys did. Davis uh, wanted to get a little bit of run in, get a little rhythm. Um, it was 11 minutes. He was clearly, and you wouldn't expect it, not going at you know 150 miles an hour. Six points, a rebound, an assist. Um, two of six you know, from the field. Two of six from the floor. Anything you see out of Davis? I, I was I was mostly kind of impressed and happy that he just wanted to get out and play. Like yeah. that to me was like I want to go play. Everybody else is sitting. I don't care. I want to play. Well, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, Brian. He he had by his standards a down season, and it certainly ended on a really disappointing note for him in terms of going out in the first round, in terms of the injuries not being available. And I, I think he is both aware from a personal pride sense, but also aware from a I hear all this stuff sense that this year needs to be a hell of a lot better. And people are people are looking to see like how does Anthony Davis respond to all this because you know I know LeBron, I, am, uh, Le, I, am, well, I am definitely LeBron, LeBron and AD are seen as you know not just superstar peers to Anthony Davis but two superstars who if need be will kick their fellow superstar in the ass if it's necessary and that is not something that you typically you typically expect f to be necessary at all with a superstar player so I, I think AD is cognizant of all this stuff swirling around him. And I, I think it's great, like you said, that he wants to go out there and just start setting a tone. 
for mm-hmm. the season. And, and again, it's not about did he go out and dominate in the first quarter of a preseason game against the the quasi nets. Uh, net. No, and just and just go and play and you know start the process perhaps earlier than you would be given an excuse to. And I I, I think that's good. Um, and in you know we're going to talk about this in the context of Malik Monk, uh, who did make an impression, I think to say the least. That you know Davis at worst is you know if he goes out and kind of does his thing, he's the ninth, eighth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, whatever best player in the NBA. He's capable of being a top five guy. And like the difference between that when you're talking about elite superstar type dudes is really significant for what the Lakers can be. Um, and so you know we'll see we'll see where it goes. Um, Monk, six of 12 from the floor, um, certainly was the guy that everybody was talking about, you know, social media wise, Lakers fans, 15 points, hit three of six from three point range, of course, coming off a career high 41% in Charlotte last year to see him at 50%. He had a couple rebounds. He had an assist. He had a block shot. Um, all of this in 21 minutes. Uh, Dwight called him the microwave. Yeah, we got a Friday practice. Yeah, that's not gonna. That shouldn't stick. That is Vinnie Johnson. It can only be Vinnie Johnson. No, I mean, look, if we can come up with some plays on words with Monk or whatever, like you know, Monks, they work solo. He can create his own shot. You call him the Monk, Thelonious Monk. That TV show Monk, Monk Fish, whatever. (laughs) Like we'll we'll, we'll workshop all this crap. What we are not doing. No, no. Um, Bad nickname, bad, bad yet, uh, hopefully not permanent nickname aside, though. What did you, what did you think? Because like, you know, again, the, you, when you break down guys who can make really where we're not sure where the upside is, like what it exactly looks like the range on monk is really big. Sunday was an example of like, Oh, okay. If he's that guy, it makes a difference. So what were your impressions, Andy, of, of what you saw from Monk on Sunday? I mean, obviously, like I said, he did this against the Brooklyn Net. So there's only so much you like, there's only so much that I think anybody should responsibly read into it. That being said, he can only play well against whoever Brooklyn decides to play. And it's he the played Nets, well. But the Nets with a Z. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the Brooklyn Net because it's, Either really, one. it's like they were essentially. You like, know what it was, Andy? It was the Brooklyn Nets. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're no longer in the. They beat the Lakers by 30 or whatever. Well, they're also no longer matter. in the uh, Progoroff age. But like, there, there were some really cool sequences for him in the, in the first half. Um, the, the block that you had mentioned. Um, you know, th- th- that came, there was also like a, like a steal and a foul that was drawn. And then when the Lakers got the ball, he created his own three, um, in the third quarter, he had a really cool move where he'd driven inside. Then he let a defender fly by and then he just casually hit a layup and like, yeah, you, nice you, saw, move. you saw a little bit of in between game with him. Like we, we talked with Jacob Rood with, uh, silver screen and roll who happened to, essentially cover Malik Monk last season because he was part of the Lonzo wire, which includes the Lamello wire. I guess it's what it's called or the ball family extended wire, whatever it's formally whatever called. It was, for he, was USA on, he was on that beat. Right. Right. So he saw a lot of Malik Monk and he, he talked with us about how, you know, Monk has his defensive deficiencies and he is not anywhere close to what you would define as a complete player, but he's got a lot going offensively and he's somebody that can create his own shot you know we'll see the degree to which he can do it under duress against much better defenders than the net had tonight but but the bottom line is he he did things and this is a guy that you and I have talked about we're not even sure where his place in the rotation actually is right well if he plays on if he plays like he did on Sunday consistently it's going to be the the answer is somewhere um like he's going to play but i what i mean look i mean the lakers as a group shot 36 36 37 percent um 36 and a half um i just wasn't sure which way i was supposed to round until i looked back at the box score and the offense as a whole looked really raggedy which is what you would expect um you know they're playing without their um their their most important offensive players for most of the game um certainly playing without their lead initiators in, in Westbrook and LeBron. And so it's hard to take big lessons out of the, the whole thing. But I think what you can do is start to try to figure out, okay, what, what, what would this guy look like next to? And, you know, because these role players, Andy, they, they work in the context 
of the big three. How is Malik Monk going to look next to Russell Westbrook? What is he going to look like playing with LeBron? How does Kendrick Nunn look next? To, all of these things doesn't really matter what they look like when those guys aren't available because if they aren't available, the Lakers aren't going to win anything. Um, so let's 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 keep let's stay on Monk and also want to talk about THT in this con in this context too because along with Kendrick Nunn, those were the guys who I think were most responsible for the Lakers' offense and what they did, and some things that look good, and then some things that maybe didn't. We'll talk about that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Sleeper. In 2018, the fantasy experts at Sleeper realized fantasy basketball, it was broken. Games were won and lost based on whose players had more scheduled games that week. It made no sense, required no strategy. So in 2020, Sleeper released a brand new way of playing fantasy basketball. It's called Game Pick. It's available only on Sleeper. And Game Pick, owners pick a single game per week for each starter to count towards their team's total score, ensuring an even number of games played between opponents so there's no more losing sleep because your opponent's players had more scheduled games to play that week. No more giving up halfway through the season because, my God, this is busy work. And it's like you got a life. You don't have time for all this nonsense. But in game picks, you pick one game per week for each player based on stuff like player matchups, home versus away, opponent's defensive ranking, pace of play, yada, yada, yada. They offer redraft. They offer keeper. They offer dynasty. So if you prefer strategy in your fantasy basketball as opposed to just laborious busy work and you are going to love game pick so download who are the, the people app. who prefer the laborious <laughs> busy work? like that's my jam yeah, like, give we, me more of that i don't want it to be fun and easy give me fantasy basketball that is laborious busy work we, we call that demo mike trudell <laughs> um, you're going to love game pick download the sleeper app start a league with your friends today you will not be disappointed it's true Andy, about Mike. It is. Um, <laughs> I, I play in his league. <laughs> I know you do. I played uh, in a league with Mike. We love Mike. He's our it's, friend. It's, in it's intense. It's a lot. <laughs> yes, it is. It is, as the kids say, Andy, extra. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this, though. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device so you catch the game live on. Another lets you stream your favorite shows. Sunday would have been like a big, perfect example of this. You're Ooh. watching sports highlights on one phone. You've got your, you know, one, another game on another phone. You're watching, you know, uh, the logins. You got that from your neighbor and her girl, his girlfriend and all this other stuff just trying to get everything a simple way to take all that entertainment you love no hassle get your tv together it's called direct tv stream it brings your live tv and on-demand favorites together like nothing you've ever seen before so you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows in one place it means no more juggling remotes no need to buy another device ever again and the best part there's no annual contract so get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more about it at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. A compatible device is required and content varies by package. So, Andy, when when we sort of like we talk about Monk, like to say it's great to see what he can do cuz he at least a little bit you could look at as like okay, on the floor if he's going to play and he can hold up defensively and do all that stuff, he is going to be somebody who might be in an in, in an offensive finishing role create initiate do stuff like that and be a guy who generates offense himself but that said like when he plays with Westbrook when he plays with LeBron when he plays like certain things become more important can he be a better like a really good spot up shooter can he cut can he do all that so we don't get to see all of that on Sunday but like I said if he does what he did on Sunday consistently at the very least what we learned is He's going to play like that kind of thing will get him on the floor. Yeah. I mean, assume, assuming the defense holds up because if other guys can do the and same he wasn't thing, minus five for whatever the hell that, well, means I mean, I, I don't care game. about that. It doesn't it mean game. much. I'm just, no, I mean, whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't put, I don't care about that a and B I apologize I, for mentioning it. Well, I, yes, you really, should. <laughs> um, but the reason though, that I bring up the defense in this is because if other guys are also making shots, which was the point with what the Lakers did this offseason because they clearly, and you and I both think rightly, prioritize juicing up the offense after two years of incredible defense, but at times the offense just not being reliable and you know, I think really pushing up uh, against the limits of what you can do as an elite contender with an, you know, an offense in, that is not always elegance. reliable. Inelegant. Yeah. In inelegant and often not reliable. If other guys can hit shots too, then Frank Vogel is going to start looking for tiebreakers like who's playing better defense. Mm -hmm. If Monk, though, can be passable, 
if he can be passable defensively doing what we saw in Sunday's game, then you are correct. Then he does start ending up a guy that looks like he's going to be in the rotation. All right. So figuring out the, the competition of like THT started at uh, – Taylor Horton Tucker started at um, shooting guard on on Sunday. Very inefficient day, 3 of 11 from the field. He only made one of his four three-pointers. He had four rebounds, three assists. There were things that he did that looked good. He got in the lane pretty easily a lot. Um, and things that didn't look as good, you know, defensively had a couple nice tips, you know, a couple, you know, things like that using his wingspan and whatever. Um, the part that I thought was actually most interesting was he started next to Kendrick Nunn and particularly I thought in the third quarter to the extent that they were sort of doing anything like, in a, it, you know, they've only been in camp for a week and these are not your lead guards under any circumstances of those two. They had THT in that lead guard role, which makes a little bit of sense, both in their skill set and also THD was here last year. Um, and and none essentially playing a, a an off ball scoring guard role. And that to me was interesting as much in terms of a what it could mean for THT, but also the possibility of how much you might see and how much interest they have in putting none next to Westbrook, whether as a potential starter. That is at least a live option, or certainly in different bench combinations. So that stuck out to me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it was hard to tell. I thought uh, in that second half, once AD was out there, like who was getting the bulk of that initiation versus you know who was considered more of that of that scoring threat. Um, my big takeaway from watching both of them do it, especially in the first half, where AD was actually an option out there and a focal point for defenses, is that neither one of them seems ready to be like a primary initiator for sets, mm-hmm. which is fine, actually. For I mean, for the time being, that is not yeah, what you, you would, expect you from either one of them. None didn't do that as a point guard last year in Miami. Right. I mean, that wasn't right. really I, his job. I, I, right. I, I, I bring this up not as a criticism of either one of them because, again, in, in a perfect, full rostered world, that you're going to be looking for them to be secondary initiators anyway. What, what I found most interesting about it is just the idea of watching THT and Nunn at this point, you know, preseason game one, and then watching that evolution for both of them as potential playmakers and how much they actually grow with it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that the more that they can do along those lines, A, it opens up more potential rest options for LeBron and Russell Westbrook, and it just opens up more things for the offense to do in general. So that's just something oh, sure. I'm going to be watching for over the course of the season. Yeah, and I look, it was THD wasn't great. He did some nice things. He wasn't great, but like you can see, I, I mean, I thought that he certainly physically he continues to improve, look different. You know, the those two finishes on the dunks were were very impressive. He gets up and like all that, and the 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 consistent ability to get the ball on the floor and get into the paint and to the rim is very impressive. Yeah, it is. And he does it in kind of like that. He's got that sort of old man game style with young man hops and, um, you know, athleticism, whatever, you know, he, he moves around pretty well, but he's crafty. And so you can see how it is and, and they want to give him a lot of responsibility. You can see how that skill set can really develop into something that could be very versatile, um, and very useful for them. Um, you, you know what? Really quick, too. Sure, um, go ahead. One th- there was a there was a sequence where uh, Kent Bazemore had a really nice play. The, the Lakers were working in transition, and Bazemore ended up in the corner, and the ball got passed to him, and he made an, a quick pass, uh, touch pass. Oh, to, inside. De- to DeAndre Jordan. Yeah, to DeAndre the Jordan, yep. and it, it was a really really nice play. I. I I thought DeAndre, by the way, his game, I thought his overall game, he was okay. He was not particularly good, not particularly bad. I, but I did think that his, you could see the positive effect of just his energy on both ends of the floor. Like he, he works while he's out he there. He did, like, he did what you would expect DeAndre Jordan right. to do. And like, I think for me, I, I'll let you, I, I apologize. For, you know, no, no, it's fine. Point, but like, I feel like, again, I'm at that place with Jordan where it's like, it, you know, he started today next to Davis, but given who else, it's not surprising. I don't, I don't really care. Davis was going to play a quarter. All 
there it just functionally there's a big difference between Jordan starting every night and you're using up, you know, 25 to 30 minutes a night or whatever between Jordan and Dwight versus DJ being the extra Dwight if you need it slash extra body if the matchup dictates it. If he's your third center, essentially, that's pretty good. Like, you know, experienced, you can drop him in a lineup. He'll understand what's going on. You're not going to have you don't you don't have to coach around him in the same way, by the way. That when you talk about Rondo as somebody who I think seems to understand he may not play very much this year, in the 20 games, 15 games, whatever it is, where you do need him, you know exactly what you're going to get when you put him in the game. Yeah, and I think that's with- a, and I think that's what Jordan is going to be too. I just hope that's I hope that's the context in which he's used. If it is, great signing. Love that they picked him up. If he's going to play 15, 18 minutes a night then I don't like it as much. But we'll see. I mean, yeah, I know. I don't disagree. I, and and really what I was bringing up in the past wasn't so much uh, sure, Jordan other than, uh, other than just pointing out, I, I thought that I could see the positive impact of his energy. That pass Baysmore made was really nice. He had three assists on the night. And it was a reminder on top of what we were talking about with, with Nunn and THT, with them, even with them not being ready to be primary initiators, there's still guys who are capable of moving the ball this team has a lot of guys who can move the ball, even if they're not guys who can run sets. They're guys no, who are actually pretty passers. Yeah, right. And I, like I remember when when we covered the Kobe Powell teams, one of the things that made those teams so good was they had an abundance of guys, like between Kobe and Powell and Lamar Odom, Fisher, you know, Jordan Farmar. Meta World Peace was an underrated passer. Like they had a lot of guys on that team who could just move the ball around, even if they didn't, even if they didn't have a lot of guys who could necessarily run an entire set. Right, guys who are smart with moving the ball quick can make move, a lot happen. Make the yep. quick pass, the right yep. pass on yep. time to the player who needs it. And it, yep. and I, you know, Carmelo Anthony is a good passer. Like you know, he's criticized some for not doing it enough over the course of his career. But he's a good passer. Um, you know, guys like that, you know, can, can do it. Baysmore looked, you know, so yeah, I completely agree. And I think that should be a strength of the team this year. Um, uh, one of, there was a, uh, I would first want to thank everybody for making uh locked on Lakers. Your first listen every morning. We are here five days a week now, Andy. Monday through yeah. Friday. We are into this. Uh, so every day, like a seven 11, baby, <laughs> wake up like captain munchies, the place my friend worked in Australia that was open 24, seven, You know why Andy? Cause they didn't have a door. <laughs> Somebody had story. to be there or they were going to get robbed. So, um, get up every morning, listen to us, find another show on the network, fantasy, whatever you're into and, uh, stay with us. But anyway, I, I, I want a quick thought on, um, the the interesting energy that returned to the building on Sunday in a big way <laughs> uh, from Dwight Howard. I was going to say in a big purple-haired way. Oh, my goodness. That was a thing, and uh, we'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bars ever. Bars covered in 100% chocolate. They are soft, easy to chew, not like the deadbeat ones that require like a hammer and a chisel and a chainsaw, and that's just too much. For a snack, it's just that's way. I don't. I don't know why you would put yourself through that for just no. like a midday pick me up. That's built bars that's though. They taste great. They're healthy. They're great for health conscious people. F- great for the keto folks. Low calorie, low sugar, high protein, high fiber. Awesome, awesome taste. You got the twelve original flavors, including raspberry, coconut almond, salt caramel, banana bread. New flavors including cherry barcia, lemon almond cheesecake, cookies and cream. They're perfect for people like me who just love cool, interesting. Taste combinations don't want to feel like you're eating the same thing over and over. That gets boring. So go to BuiltBar.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You get 15% off your first order. Again, promo code LOCKED15, 15% off at BuiltBar.com. Before we get to Dwight, I do want to, I mean, we and we really do not need to spend a lot of time on this, but Austin Reeves, I will say, you know, physically, not necessarily terribly imposing could you know fill out that frame a little bit but as a 14th guy on the roster which is what he currently is i did get the impression that he could be somebody who if you needed to put him in games for a week or so could come in and play 15 minutes without breaking anything like we talked about with these other guys we'll make the right pass we'll be in the right spot defensively we'll you know we'll probably be overmatched at times but won't do a lot of stupid bad ridiculous things certainly won't try to shoot you out of games 
uh, thought he did a, a, a nice job. So um, kudos to him. Uh, let's talk about Dwight. That was weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a hell of an outing for Dwight. What the, uh, I, 13, th- so 11, 11 points on three of seven for the floor, six rebounds, uh, five, five of them offensive. Yeah. A block shot. He had a steal. He had six fouls and a flagrant. Yeah. <laughs> so seven. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and seven I, be honest, I, I watched the sequence where he fouled out, took a free throw. I am still all of this, by the way, was in 13 minutes. I have no. Well, first I of all, the, still the, the not review entirely sure Dwight played what 13 happened. minutes, but he was on the floor an extra 13 minutes for the review. That review took forever. And then he took a technical free throw that he was ineligible to take because he had been actually disqualified from the game. And no, like the whole thing was very strange. And it seemed like he actually ended up getting ejected for something that he was saying while talking with James Harden, who was on the court like I, in a I think I, I thought he got I thought that was just his sixth foul, like when they when they totaled everything up. And perhaps nobody was because like Stu Lance on the broadcast kept saying, like, I think he's got six fouls and they're letting him shoot. And I think they were all just confused because they're like, How could he have six fouls? He's only been out there for I don't 12 know. It minutes. Did, it, the whole thing was weird. But b- beyond that, Dwight was very much, and this is again odd and slightly disconcerting for a preseason Sunday afternoon preseason game was very much in his I'm facing Nikola Jokic uh some people just like to watch the world burn <laughs> mode um on Sunday and I am interested at your thoughts on having sort of the Dwight energy because there are certain things about him that I forgot like the energy is very good the defensive position all that stuff sets a brutal screen like i had kind of forgotten how good a screener and that came in handy a couple times um you could see like the difference of a dwight screen out there up top but just the reintroduction of the dwight howard energy into the lakers deal (laughs) what were your your initial thoughts um i think things need to be going well for that to be a net positive i think Mm -hmm. if things are going well Dwight's nonstop energy, the always being on, you know, like the the energy that a- anybody who's ever spent time around either stand up comics or a lot of actors, people like that, like people or Jay Crowder, there are people like that are always on, like they're always on. And Dwight, at least publicly, I have no idea what he's like privately, but publicly, he's weird. I think you would agree, <laughs> always on. Yeah, he's weird. Yeah. But um, he's an odd dude. I think that stuff, I mean, on the court and off the court, I guess, are two separate things. Like, on the court, I mean, we even saw it during that playoff series against Denver that you referenced in 2020. In the beginning, Dwight seemed to be serving a very specific, uh, useful utility by irritating the hell out of Nikola Jokic. By around game three, that utility had basically worn out its <laughs> uh, usefulness and Dwight was starting to play less and frankly contribute less. Um, so it's going to be a matter of, I think, picking his spots with that stuff on, on the floor because all joking aside, Dwight is a following machine and he is a following machine. I think even when he is trying not to be a following machine and that can obviously cause problems and then in terms of the team dynamic with chemistry, I think if things are going well, that stuff can be just part of you know the overall dynamic uh, and personality uh, of a locker room. I think if things aren't going well, that stuff is going to get old really fast. Yeah. I mean, look, Andy, this is so many. It's like so many things like about this team are tied to are they winning? Like, you know, winning makes so much you know the the rotation questions the buy in all of this stuff like just does and to your point he averaged six fouls per 36 minutes last year um in philly six the year before with the lakers so no, he's a following machine man he fouls a lot and, and that this is compared to for a guy to, that's a legitimately good defender he fouls a lot right and he plays very aggressively as he's gotten older but like he also isn't quite as quick isn't quite as whatever yeah, but like in his prime, these per 36 numbers, just I, I throw this out, not as criticism, but just for reference, are in the, the you know, mid twos, mid threes, things like that. So this is just 
he fouls a lot. So here's what I like about it, because I agree with everything you said. Having seen it again, kind of being reintroduced to what that vibe was from a couple years ago, I'm kind of glad the Lakers have it back. Not so much because I think they want to deploy that every game, but I do think to some degree that sort of that sort of player, that sort of energy and that kind of option was missing last year. Um, a little bit of an enforcer, a little bit of a wild card, a little bit of a, an antagonist um, in ways that somebody like Montrez Harrell, who plays with endless energy, doesn't do it the same way because he's not that kind of defender, because he's not, um, I think, I don't know, whether intimidating is the right word, these guys are intimidated or not. He, he's not that kind of guy. I like that they have it back and they they can play that card where it's needed. Dwight absolutely needs to control it. They got to be careful if he's not to get him out of a game or whatever. But it could come in handy. I think for a team like this, when you have so many stars to have one dude who can go in and just be that guy um, is, is very helpful, um, particularly as a front court rim protector type. Um, somebody who is happy to take some flagrants, happy to get ejected from a game if he needs to. Um, and that you can be like, that's eh, okay. If Dwight got ejected, that's eh, you're probably still okay. And so I, I just I liked it. I liked having that back. I thought, yeah. It was I, look, I agree with you. There will be there will be times throughout this season where it does come in handy. You, you know, teams need somebody who will, if nothing else, make you think twice about entering the lane. You know, make sure that you know you will pay a certain physical price for doing it, and and that's all really valuable. And again, both. Both of us were glad they re-signed Dwight. I want, I want to make sure that's clear. We it's both a great backup that, center. That's yeah, what, that's we, what you're. He's a great backup center. Yeah, we both thought that's a really one of the good best. Signing. Still one of the best in the league. Yeah, I, I just think when you take into everything, sure, that is the whole package that is Dwight. I think it is very important. Like when you and I were exchanging some text back and forth uh, before the game. You know, you were talking about you had mentioned something to the degree of it. You know, I wonder if it could have come in handy last year. And my immediate thought was, if things played out with the injuries no, the right. same way no, it did, you're right. I no, think it, that it would have worn on the team. Yeah, badly. I agree. I agree. I, you know, context matters. Winning matters. You know, all that stuff matters. And then, look, if things go south this year, it, 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 what, it's not going to be because you know, of Dwight. It's not going to be because of Dwight, but Dwight's. Utility is not going to save them right. either. I mean, all of these guys, and go back to the beginning, we'll wrap here on the, you know, again, it's like I said before at the beginning of the show, Andy, it's like all of these dudes exist in the orbit of how does it service the, you know, the, the functioning of the big three and the, the different things that all of these guys can bring potentially to form, you know, the, the, this hole that hopefully elevates the big three to get the Lakers where they want to go. Cause those are ultimately the guys who determine right. it. It's just, this is the extra 15%, 20%, whatever that number is. Um, so it was, uh, some interesting things to see the Lakers play again on Wednesday, uh, against the Suns. I'll have a couple days of practice in between, um, plenty of stuff to start watching and talk about again. Thanks for uh, joining us every day. Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you get all the breaking news as well as the podcast. If you want to, uh, watch us because we're, really handsome. Uh, and uh, yeah, every day, Monday through Friday, and we'll see everybody tomorrow.